Flying high above South America, this passenger plane flew into some serious problems. On board were 160 people. The pilots were left confused, as an unfolding crisis meant the plane was falling from the sky in the middle of the night, and the two pilots diagnosed the problem differently. The plane fell to the ground at high speed. In this video, let's examine the events leading up to where things began falling apart. Perhaps we'll be able to pinpoint the origin of the crisis that led to a disaster that claimed so many lives. West Caribbean Airways was a relatively short-lived airline that operated in the years between 1998 and 2005. West Caribbean started as a charter airline connecting Colombia with various islands in the Caribbean. Based out of Bogotá and Medellín, the air carrier expanded and also operated domestically within the country with a fleet of very small turboprop planes. As the airline grew over the following years, the airline acquired three McDonnell Douglas MD-80 series airplanes. The accident plane of discussion today has its history dating back to the early 1980s, where it flew for Continental Airlines in the United States. Once the plane was acquired by a leasing company, this MD-80 was leased out to West Caribbean in January of 2005. Problems were, however, beginning to mount at the airline. Following the crash of one of their smaller planes and growing financial problems, the future of West Caribbean didn't look promising. The accident MD-80 registered as Hotel Kilo 4374 X-Ray in August 2005 was the only airworthy plane of the type in their fleet. Authorities had grounded the other two and the airline couldn't afford to pay for their maintenance. Still, operations continued and West Caribbean charted out this particular MD-80 to a travel agency based on the Caribbean island of Martinique by the name of Globe Trotter Voyages. They sold a package holiday to Panama, and on the evening of August 15, 2005, 152 passengers needed to be transported home to Martinique. The West Caribbean MD-80 left Medellin and flew northwest to Panama City's Tocumen Airport. The plane should have left for its flight to Martinique at 10.50 p.m., but the flight was late getting into Panama, the reason being that the airline struggled to pay for its fuel for the journey. Here in Panama, the passengers were loaded for their flight across the Caribbean Sea. The flight was packed, and complications with boarding meant the flight was two hours behind schedule. Eventually, the MD-80 left the gate at just before 1 in the morning on August 16th. Flying as West Caribbean Airways Flight 708, the plane left Panama's Tocumen Airport at precisely 12.58 a.m. For the first six minutes of the flight, the pilots flew by hand before engaging the autopilot at 1.04. The autopilot climbed the plane up to flight level 310, roughly 31,000 feet. Up on the flight deck was 40-year-old Captain Omar Ospina. He was a somewhat proficient pilot on the MD-80, with around 1100 hours logged on the type. The first officer was a very young pilot, though he was of similar experience on this plane. 21-year-old David Muniz had 862 hours in the plane, and just 1300 in total. The two men took the plane into the night heading eastward. The flight path that night would take them over the most northern regions of Colombia and Venezuela. Flight 708 climbed up to 31,000 feet without issue, the pilots and passengers settling in for the flight. The flight crew were in communication with controllers and barranquier and they checked in as normal without reporting any problems. It was 1.26 in the morning. At this time, the plane's engine anti-ice systems were engaged. Engine anti-icing heats up part of the exterior of the engine inlets to prevent ice accumulation. It works by diverting some of the heated air inside a plane's engine to the necessary components that need heating. Because it takes away some of the intake air instead of it being used for propulsion, engine performance is decreased and fuel consumption increased if the anti-ice system is on. Investigators determined by reviewing the engine parameters as the plane reached cruising altitude, the anti-ice system was engaged. There was a conversation about the weather between the two pilots. Thunderstorms were in the region, and they wanted to avoid them if they could. The first officer in charge of handling radio communication radioed a request to deviate from their intended flight path, 
before also requesting a climb to flight level 330, 33,000 feet. Planes have certain specifications pertaining to performance that depend on a plane's weight and balance and so forth. At 31,000 feet, with the engine anti-ice engaged, the MD-80 could comfortably fly at 31,000 feet and cruise at Mach 0.75, that is 75% of the speed of sound, with its maximum takeoff weight of 149,500 pounds or 67,800 kilograms. That is all according to an official document released by McDonnell Douglas in 1990. This was a heavy plane, every seat was filled, and given the nature of the flight, catering to leisure travellers who had been away on vacation for a week, their belongings stored in the cargo hold amounted to considerable weight also. Still, the pilots calculated correctly before the plane left the gate that the plane was within its maximum takeoff weight, but only just barely. The accident report highlighting that investigators also believe this to be the case. A plane's performance can actually increase throughout a flight. As fuel is burned off, the plane does become gradually lighter. It can be necessary to achieve optimal efficiency to sometimes change the cruising altitude. In this case though, the pilots sought a climb to avoid weather. The accident report highlights that 33,000 feet was out of the plane's limits if the anti-ice system was kept on. To the pilots though, that never sprung to mind. At 1.40, Flight 708 begins its stepping climb up to 33,000 feet, a difference of just 2,000. To do this via the autopilot, the plane was programmed to lift the nose but maintain its current airspeed, so the auto throttle was in control of the engine power. The plane on its own would only make incremental moves, first to 31,450 feet at 1.40 and 34 seconds before leveling off for about 20 seconds, and again at 32,300 feet at 1.41 and 50 seconds. The plane was struggling to carry out the pilot's commands on its own. With the engine anti-ice still active, taking some of its energy away, even with the engines running at maximum thrust, the airspeed began dropping and wouldn't stabilize. So they changed the autopilot setting to vertical speed mode. In this setting, the rate of climb is constant. The trade-off of that, however, is that airspeed would drop considerably quickly. The time was now 1.42 and the engine anti-ice was switched off by the first officer as instructed by the captain. The plane responded accordingly and there was an increase in engine performance. Sure enough, the plane did now make it to 33,000 feet, within new limits having now switched off the anti-ice. However, the pilots noticed that their airspeed had now dropped to Mach 0.70, and they also had a considerable nose-up attitude. Over time though, that speed would come back and the nose would lower. By 147, the plane had returned to Mach 0.75 and the nose had dropped slightly, and the flight seemed to continue on as normal for several more minutes. In that time, the first officer left the cockpit to use the lavatory, food was served to the pilots, and there was a handoff from controllers to Venezuelan airspace. From the outside looking in, the flight at this point seems stable. We have, however, now reached the point where things go wrong. The problem that would develop over the next few minutes wouldn't be sudden, but rather a gradual process that would catch the pilots off guard. At 1.51 in 57 seconds, the first officer asked if the anti-ice should be re-engaged. This was a thought also shared by the captain. He asked if the first officer could see ice. He replied no, but the captain seemingly turned the anti-ice system back on anyway. We actually don't know why he did this. Perhaps he saw ice on the plane's exterior on his side. His words on the cockpit voice recording transcript in his reply to the first officer was unintelligible. In this moment, from the turning on of the engine anti-icing, the plane began to change, as there was a recorded drop in engine performance. The airspeed started decreasing, and the nose of the plane began to rise once again. This time, not to climb, but rather as a result of the plane attempting to stay at 33,000 feet. The plane was now outside of its limits. By 156, the airspeed had decreased to Mach 0.62 and the nose reached 7.2 degrees nose up. It was perhaps around this time 
that the captain began to notice something was wrong as airspeed continued to decrease and was now at a critical point of nearing stalling speed. He took manual control of the plane and disconnected the autopilot. Flight 708 was put into a descent to fly back down to 31,000 feet. Though the captain had taken over manual control of the plane and achieved a vertical speed of negative 2,500 feet per minute, the airspeed did not increase much. In the rapid descent, Flight 708 entered an area of severe turbulence, and airspeed over the plane's wings and air intake into the engines was substantially reduced. Therefore, the engines themselves were producing less thrust, as reflected in the data of engine parameters on the flight data recorder. A large updraft of turbulence was believed to have hit the plane from below, significantly raising the nose and increasing the angle of attack once again. We need to reiterate here that thrust was now significantly reduced, and at an already slow speed, the plane demands a certain amount of power from the engines to maintain steady flight. The plane had now fallen below that limit. It would all be well and good for me to say at this point that the plane entered an aerodynamic stall and that wouldn't be incorrect, but we should take a closer look outside and examine what was happening on the wings in a little more detail. For the wings of a plane to achieve lift, air needs to flow smoothly over and under it. The airflow clings to the wing, where it accelerates and exits the wing downward. This is a very simple explanation, but we can go a bit further for the sake of this video when talking about stalls. In this case, the angle of attack here was great enough to the point that the airflow over the wing separated around here. In doing so, it not only does not generate lift, but also creates this cavity of air that in the case of Flight 708 became turbulent. This right here also exposes a particular quirk in not only the MD-80, but all other aircraft that are built similarly. The MD-80 can be put into a category of airplanes known as T-tailed planes. The engines are mounted at the rear instead of beneath the wings. The horizontal stabilizer is mounted to the top of the tail fin, giving it the distinctive T-shape. There are many planes similarly designed like this. Because the engines on this plane are where they were, they were in a sort of dead zone now being behind the wings. The engines couldn't get the air intake they needed to function properly, leading to a loss of thrust. This effect does not stop at the engines. This could also apply to the horizontal stabilizer and elevator, which control the plane's pitch. They too require airflow like the wings to function. Focusing back on Flight 708, the lack of air intake in the engines at this point began to reflect on the cockpit instruments as the engine gauges showed decreasing performance. The two pilots diagnosed the problem differently. Whilst First Officer Muniz correctly noted that the plane had reached a stall scenario, Captain Ospina thought that the plane had just suffered engine failure, though the first officer did try to communicate his observations. The MD-80 then began falling as the plane entered a deep stall. The high nose-up attitude of the aircraft had put the horizontal stabilizer in that dead zone, blocking the airflow it needed to work. So long as the plane was in this state, the pilots had no control of the pitch. The plane was uncontrollable. The vertical speed plummeted and would continue to do so until it reached over negative 12,000 feet per minute. According to the investigation, Captain Ospina continuously believed that engine failure was the problem. He even applied to stabilize a trim up, certainly not helpful to the situation. In a time period of about one minute, over half of the plane's altitude had been drained. The time had just gone to two in the morning. It is noted in multiple sources that the pilots said absolutely nothing in these final moments. Seconds later, West Caribbean Airways Flight 708 crashed underside first into the Venezuelan countryside, southwest of Maracaibo. Those who lived close by to the crash site arrived to discover a scene of total devastation, with no survivors. All 160 people on board were killed. Flight 708 is the deadliest air accident to have ever occurred involving the MD-80. This was an accident that involved failure on multiple levels. Firstly, the airline. West Caribbean Airways failed to communicate important information to their MD-80 pilots. Boeing, who acquired McDonnell Douglas, 
released a bulletin in 2002 warning air carriers of possible stalling scenarios induced by the plane's autopilot, stating that pilots should keep a watchful eye on airspeed as the plane will drain airspeed to stall limits without warning if it is programmed to do so. Pilot error was obviously noted as a significant force behind this accident. Spatial disorientation coupled with poor management of the plane and pilot communication were put down as prime causal factors in the crash. West Caribbean Airways ceased operations just one month after the disaster. Hello everyone, thanks once again for watching this video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed as there is always a new video coming soon. We are thinking about perhaps changing the day of upload. Nothing really decided yet, but we'll keep you all updated on the community tab if we do. Speaking of videos, there should be an additional video coming this Tuesday. That has been in the works in the background of the previous weeks, so that should be out then. Anyway, I won't make this outro too long. A massive thanks once again to my Patreon supporters for their support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now, so if you do see your name here, a massive thanks to you. Shout out this week to Florian Rats, who recently joined the Patreon. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. If you yourself want to support the channel further, then consider joining the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. And that is it from me today. Have a great weekend, and I should see you for a video this coming Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.